healthcare systems is everybody know me by the way i think everybody knows me here yeah all right good um so we're going to talk about healthcare systems today we're going to focus on um a little bit of information on payments upcoming sort of healthcare system payments finance and those type of things um and and a little bit of some other stuff but in general that's what we're going to do so these are the objectives today so we're going to talk about population health some trends really focused around reimbursement um, and then how this is going to impact all of you obviously and then we might talk about some other things as far as what affects health outcomes so still a crystal ball um, if you've seen this presentation before it's been a crystal ball for a while but it's becoming more and more clear uh, each year and so now we have some timelines and i'll share some of that with you as far as when things are going to sort of take place and and how they may look and we've talked about the triple aim before uh, and if you don't everybody heard of the triple aim i hope right so the population health is really the outcomes of populations right the experience of care that's sort of the survey information how what the patient experience was like and then cost and some people use the equation of value let's say value uh, I used to always say value is equal to um, outcome over cost. Um, now there's a multiplier in there. Value uh, equals appropriateness times outcome over cost because we want it to be appropriate. There's also something now called the quadruple aim, and that is satisfaction. And it's really based on, uh, on employee satisfaction and the satisfaction of the system uh, as they're taking care of the patient. So this is kind of a description of population health, right? So health outcomes of a group of individuals, including the distribution of such outcomes within the group. So really it's looking at a whole group. It could be the population that you care for. It could be the population of the city that you are in. It could be the population of the region. As, as the outcome um, data becomes more and more um, transparent, we will start to get measured on outcomes of the patients for our region. So it won't be based simply on the folks that you see. Um, it might be the folks in your area that you are somewhat responsible for, even if they don't come to your office. Social determinants, health inequities, and policies are all gonna play into this. So you have to think about the population you serve, and I don't care what specialty you're in, this goes across the board, you have to think about things such as uh, health literacy, barriers to care, whether it's access, financial, transportation, you name it. All these things play a role in what type of outcomes you're going to have. And then population health management as a whole typically includes things like complex case management. So these are people focused on taking care of complex patients. Uh, disease management, wellness, transitions of care. Everybody knows that, right? We've had some focus training on transition to care. We pay attention to that. That's a huge way to impact um, readmission rates, right? And probably the most important piece of that is medication reconciliation. And then emergency department management. So our folks that come to the ER a lot, and why? Is it because they don't have access to a primary? They don't have access to care? They don't understand what appropriate use of an emergency room is? There's lots of reasons. ACOs, um, accountable care organizations, are one thing that people are talking about a lot right now. We're not real sure what the future of those organizations are, but they certainly are in play right now. And it may be something that you interact with when you start work wherever you're going to work at. Um, ACOs tend to be very, have a very strong primary care base because you have to have good chronic disease management. And it's accountable for quality and total cost for a population of patients. What does that mean? That means that in an ACO, the way most of them work now, you have cost accountability. That means that the risk has been shifted from the insurer to you as the ACO. So the ACO has a responsibility of managing cost. That means that if you're in an ACO where you lose money, you lose money, right? So that's, that's cost shifting to an extent. 
They're linked to quality improvement and cost. That's the value proposition we talked about. And you have to have good measurement systems. And you have to rely on that. And you have to have complex case management and all these things. So these are organizations that are out there. There's lots of different variations. It's questionable where we're going to go with these, if they're going to survive or not. The ones that are out there have had mixed success, if any. Some have done OK. There are some that do quite well, but they typically are verti vertically integrated systems. So you think of Kaiser Permanente in California. They own their own clinics. They own their own hospitals. They have regional healthcare services. So if you have a head trauma, you don't just go to a Kaiser hospital. You go to a Kaiser head trauma center. It might be a ways away. They fly you there. And they are self-insured. They have their own insurance plan. So that's a vertically integrated system where they can measure everything and they can control costs. And so um, they do things in that fashion. So systems like that might be able to pull this off. Um, I always bring up NCQA because I think it's a group for everybody to watch. Um, they do things like they own and manage HEDIS. So health care effectiveness data and information set, that's the largest prescribed to data set in the nation. It's what a lot of hospitals and outpatient clinics will use um, for benchmarking their metrics, their quality metrics. They do patient-centered medical home recognition, which we'll talk about a little bit later. They do patient-centered specialty practice recognition. That's for non-primary care practices. They do accountable care organization accreditation. So you're starting to see a pattern here. Health plans, new health plans, disease management, care management. They're doing all the things that people are talking about now for population health. So they have their fingers and everything. They're private. They're not controlled by the feds, but they're very well linked to the feds. Here's one definition of patient-centered medical home, um, and it'll be a little bit important as we start talking about some of the payment models. Uh, this comes from Starfield's work um, back in the 90, or 2005 was when it was published. Um, the first four are kind of the essential things that she found. And she looked at systems globally to see what improved health outcomes, lowered costs, improved equity of care. And here, are the, these are the major components. So first, contact access, meaning that the patient chooses to go to the primary care office first. Patient-focused care over time, that's longitudinal care. You know the patient. You don't end up doing a bunch of stuff every time they come in with abdominal pain because you already know historically why they have the ab abdominal pain versus a one-time episode. Comprehensive care, what's the basket of services you offer at your site? the more the better. And then coordinated care. That's really about how everybody works together across a system to help the patient navigate through. And they also found that if you do those first four, the next three happen naturally. You're more family oriented, more community oriented, and more culturally competent. And culturally competent doesn't just mean you know about a culture. It's really about engaging the patient in their health belief system. So understanding what the patient wants to do how they want to use the healthcare system, what's important to them in the, in the sort of in the whole spectrum of their, of their culture. So that's kind of a, a broad definition. Um, this is something I like to share because we think of healthcare typically from our perspective, but there are lots of people thinking about healthcare, including people who have to pay for healthcare. So IBM uh, is an example of that, right? So they, they have companies or their company has offices all across the world, and they can look at the healthcare expenditures of their employees in various nations. And what they found is, is that in the U.S., they spend a whole lot more money for their employees, and they don't get the same kind of outcomes. So they're not happy with the U.S. healthcare system. And people who have to pay for it, they're taking a look at this. So even, and this, is, this slide is probably, oh, at least from 10 years ago. So this is not something new. They looked at this and they said, you know, our healthcare system, and they're looking at this from an engineering and operations perspective, um, we ought to do things differently. And so, you know, you think about it. We still do this. We still do this. Today's care is still today's care. Well, patients make an appointment to see me. We still do that, right? Or do you have a registry? Now, registry means you have to have the information technology infrastructure, and the ability to have a registry so you can say, who are all my type 2 diabetics, and how many of them are uncontrolled, and haven't been seen in the last three months? And then we call them. 
as opposed to, well, they'll just show up when they show up, right? So that's what they're talking about here, managing registries, managing, managing chronic diseases. Care is determined by today's problem and time available. Well, they show up for this presentation, which may or may not be the reason they're there, or they've got a list off of the Internet, or they've got 10 other things, and you deal with whatever you can. Versus, well, I'm bringing them in, and I know why we're bringing them in, and I'm going to do pre-visit planning. So I've already taken care of some lab work and some other issues that I needed to address before they ever hit my door. And I know we're going to talk about these things. That's more efficient. That's better for your time. That's less work for your staff, ultimately. Care varies by scheduled time and memory or skill of the doctor. We all remember 100% of everything, right? Of course we do. So point of service care, pop-ups, reminders. Hey, you haven't checked this. You haven't done this screening. This patient has a medication refill that's due. Or you haven't checked a lab because they're on this medication. Those types of things ought to be automated in our information technology infrastructure. Most of the time, they're not. Sometimes you have to build them. And we should get some continuing medical education or continuing professional development credit for that, right? Enabling CME. And then the next, I know I deliver high quality care because I'm well trained. Of course, right? All my hypertensives are well controlled. All my diabetics are well controlled because I do the right thing. Well, that's nice, but show me the money, right? So you have to have the data. You have to be able to say, yeah, I've got, I've checked all of my diabetics and here they are and 30% are well-controlled, and 50% are moderately well-controlled, and 20% are uncontrolled. Um, you need to know these things. You know, when we first started looking at hypertension 25, 30 years ago, and we all thought we were doing a good job, and what we found was 30% of our hypertensives were at goal, right? I'm not talking about SIU, I'm talking about nationally. So we have to measure things to be able to say you're doing a good job. Patients are responsible for coordinating their own care. Anybody here been in the U.S. healthcare system? No one here? Wow, you're all too healthy. There you go. It's simple, right? Easy, no problem. You understand all the billing statements you get. And, ima <laughs> and, imagine, and imagine the patients who maybe have a lower education level, right? Fourth grade, fifth grade, sixth grade, eighth grade, whatever it is. And they're dealing with that same system and all the ins and outs that are even confusing to highly educated people that understand the system. It's, it's a really complicated system. We got to, you know, patients tell us what happened. Well, you saw Dr. Who? Oh, you saw that? Well, what did they tell you? Well, I don't know. And they put me on a new pill, and it's blue. What blue pill is it? I don't know. Why would you get it? I don't know. So being able to track tests and referrals, that communication pattern, being able to get information back in an automated way, knowing that it came back, whether it's normal, abnormal, telling the patient. Those are things we need to know. And then we need to work as a team. The provider can't do all this by themselves. It has to be a team effort. It has to be a group of people working in conjunction to get all this stuff done. So, you know, industry is looking at this and saying, you guys are doing it wrong. Fix it. By the way, um, there are people, so Dell, you guys know Dell, right? And you guys, and we talked about Kaiser Permanente a little while ago. Kaiser Permanente is opening their own medical school. Dell is opening their own medical school. Why are they doing this? Because they're going to train them the way that they want to train them. They want a product that they can use, not what we're doing. This is, got, this is going to happen. This is, this is starting. This is the things that you're going to see. All right, now we're getting into the money. Everybody wants to get paid, right? All right, for any SIU students, you know, I always say, if you don't raise your hand, I will hire you for free. You have a job here, especially with the budget right now. I'll take you for free. So payment models. Right now, the fee for service, the foundation there is still the foundation. Somebody walks in, you do something for them, you get paid for it. That's fee for service. There are these other two tiers that some years ago were a little bit more fuzzy. They're becoming a lot more clear now. You've got this per member per month care coordination, which we always assume might just be the medical home, but it's probably going to be based on populations also. And then pay for performance. Well, that tier is going to be going down to the bottom real soon, meaning it'll be the foundation based on population health outcomes. So this is from last year. When I give this talk last year, these are the slides I had, and the night before, they repealed the sustainable growth rate, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. Um, 
Payment categories. I just want to go over these. Category one is fee for service. That's kind of what we do now most of the time. Okay. Two, three, four are these varying levels. So two is fee for service of some quality. We kind of have that in some places now. Some of the insurance plans we're contracted with, they give us some extra money if we do a few things right. Okay. Um, category three is alternative payment models. Everybody's still trying to figure out what that is. And category four is population based payment. So the health, the outcomes of your population is how we're going to decide to pay you. And here's, this was released last year, um, January, 2016. That's soon, right? That's now. 30% of Medicare payments will be in categories three and four. Alternative payment models or total population health. 30%. By 2018, 50%. And then by, oh, and overall, but by 2018, 90% will be category two, three, or four. So four is population health outcomes, three is that alternative payment model, two is some fee for service linked to quality. See what's not there? Fee for service. That's why I'm saying they're going to flip. 2018. It's not that far away. A lot of you will be in practice, right? It's coming. So we're going to talk a little bit about some data here. Real qu I'm going to go through these quick because this is old stuff, but there isn't newer stuff for the most part. These things take a lot of money and time to do, and so they don't do an updated study like this every year, two years, or five years. So these are still the most recent studies for this type of information. Um, this is Starfield data, rankings compared to 13 rich nations. And you can see out of 13 rich nations, and they're listed there, we were last in pretty much everything until you get to like life expectancy at 65 and 80 years, right? And you all know that children and women of childbearing age is the absolute worst sector of our health care outcomes. The worst. Still is. This was the World Health Organization from 2000. Again, there is no newer study. I just went to the, to the WHO site to see if there was anything going on. There's nothing new. We beat Slovenia you know, in outcomes and disability adjusted life expectancy. So we got that going for us, right? But I mean, 37th, not great, not great. Um, this was deaths from treatable conditions, Ellen Nolte. This is in um, uh, Health Affairs. It's a pretty reputable journal if you don't know that one. Um, and really, uh, just real quickly, I'm just going to mention that what you have is you have a 2003 rank on the left, and in the middle you've got a 1998 rank, okay? So they looked at the change from 98 to 2003. And in 1998, you see the U.S. is 15th. And in, 19, and in 2003, five years later, we slipped down to 19th. Now, how much did we improve during that time? Well, we actually got 5% better. But improve, we were outpaced in improvement by the other countries. So while we're getting better, we're not getting better as quickly. And it wasn't, the, it wasn't like we were first five years before, and so we had nowhere to go. We were 15th, so we had a lot of improvement capacity, but we didn't get there. So again, we're slower to, to make improvements. This is another one from Health Affairs. This is a comparison over 30 years, 75 to 2005. It's 15-year survival for 45-year-old women, 12 countries. You see the countries there. And you can see in 75, we all spent about the same amount of money. Your x-axis there is the thousands of dollars spent. And uh, and on the bottom is a percent surviving. So everybody kind of spent the same amount of money in 75, but we didn't have great outcomes. And then you move 30 years down the road, we spent a whole lot more money and we're still lagging behind in outcomes. So yet another study to show exactly the same thing. And then there's this one that always gets everybody fired up, neonatal mortality, okay? So this is moving from 2000 to 2011. You can see we got better by 10% during that time period, but everybody else on this list beat us. And, you know, so we, we don't have great outcomes. Out of those comparison countries, we're not good. This comes from the CIA, the same CIA that you know and hear about, the World, uh, World Fact book uh, by the CIA. They look at these things because health outcomes are related to your um, defense status. So the Central Intelligence Agency tracks these things. And this is open access, this stuff. You can look at it. All right, cost. I got some old slides and I got a new slide. So the red line is us. You can see back in 80, we all spent about the same amount of money. 
And over 20 some years, we spend a lot more money compared to everybody else. And from a, and a big difference there. And there are some countries in between, right? So I don't want you to think that there's no one in between there. But when you compare Germany, which is high tech, they love their technology like us. Um, they're a large pharmaceutical producer, right? You got p- companies like Bayer, you got companies for technology like Siemens. They like their tech, they got their pharma, pharma, uh, pharmacology, et cetera. And they're still spending almost, you know, half of what we, of what we spend. And from a percentage of GDP, we we're 17.4% and they were 11.6. So our gross domestic product, we're spending a big chunk. And of course, there's that economic fear. Everybody remember what happened to Greece a few years ago? You know, the thought is if you hit 20% of any economic sector, you, your sort of economy crumbles, right? So we don't want to hit 20%. So everybody was very excited about that. This is uh, new uh, data from the Commonwealth Fund. The black line is the U.S., 17.1%. So we've actually plateaued or maybe even fallen a little bit. And the next, the next one down um, is France. And so uh, Germany's right in there too. So France and Germany are right in, the, in, the, in line there of percentage of GDP that they're spending. Um, but France has number one, number two healthcare outcomes globally too. So, you know, I don't mind spending money if you got the outcomes to justify it, right? And then there's this piece, and everybody kind of knows this one. This is Medicare, right? And so we have baby boomers coming into Medicare age now, and Medicare is funded off of tax dollars, right? So there's a ratio of people paying taxes to the number of people receiving Medicare insurance, a Medicare beneficiary. And you start looking at the ratio. Well, you had a lot of people in that baby boomer age, and so they're moving into Medicare now, and you have perhaps the same or less people paying in in a ratio. So we're going to go from 3.7 people paying taxes for every Medicare beneficiary to about 2.5 between now and toward 2030. Medicare doesn't have a lot of extra money, right? So who's driving all this population outcomes changes? Medicare. CMS, that's Medicare. And so they're looking at this and saying, we need to spend less money and have better outcomes. And if we don't, this is going to kill us. We can't afford to do this anymore. So the economics are driving a lot of this. Um, and sometimes an economic crisis is what you need to drive some change. So this is what's happening. All right, we're going to get into recognition programs now, which is really what we're talking about as far as payment mechanisms go. Okay, And so I'm going to spend a, a little bit more time on this because this is real, this is what you guys are going into into practice, and it will affect all of you. Okay, so how many of you have heard of the Physician Quality Reporting System, PQRS? Okay, good. Um, So right now, this has been active, it is active, and there's two different ways to do it. There's group reporting, which is what we do at SIU, and it's based on 17 measures. So we report 17 quality metrics to Medicare every year to avoid penalties, right? To avoid penalties. Right now, it's still more about avoiding penalties as opposed to getting some extra money. There is some extra money coming in, but it's not a lot right now. Depending on who you work for, you may do registry reporting, which is not by group, but by you, the individual. So... You know, if you're a plastic surgeon, they're going to have plastic surgery metrics for you, right? And they're going to say, okay, here you are. And it's going to be, you're going to have to pick nine measures in three domains. There's six domains total, but out of three domains, you're going to have to pick nine quality metrics that you're going to report on, right? And so one of the things we're trying to work on here as far as infrastructure goes is being able to get to a point where we can help the individual provider start deciding which ones to report because they're going to get the best score, right? But you can't do, we can't do that yet. We need to get all of the data and figure out how to collect the things that we need to collect and then move forward. CG caps, we're going to talk about that in a second. That's that patient survey, right? CG caps is part of your PQRS score. Patient surveys are part of your PQRS score, okay? And there it is. That's the short name right there, clinician and group. CG, 
Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems. At the hospital, it's HCAPS, Hospital Consumer Assessment of Healthcare Providers and Systems, okay? Hospitals, HCAPS, outpatient is CG CAPS. If you work in both venues, you get both surveys. These aren't optional, they're mandatory, and they're standardized for Medicare. So, Agency for Healthcare Research Quality, that's who developed it. It's mandated. There's five domains that you get rated on. Access, how easy it is to get a phone call, get in for a visit, all those good things. Communication, how well we communicate, the providers, the staff. Care coordination, how do we help them manage the healthcare system and, and get them to the care that they need? Service, how nice are people to me? Right, that's the service piece. And then provider rating, how good is the care that you provided? We're getting rated on these things. You will be benchmarked nationally and you'll fall somewhere. And that gets fed into part of your scoring. So your surveys will affect your income. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to link this. Now, we're all subject to the same survey. So yes, I understand patients are unhappy because we didn't give them their controlled substance. But they're unhappy at every office across the country when they don't get their controlled substance. So we're all getting hit with the same survey data. Anybody heard of Physician Compare? You're going to like this one. This isn't a system that we have to report to. This is a system that reports on us. So in 2015, that was last year, Medicare did their own survey. They didn't even ask us. They just did it, right? It's the government. 14 PQRS measures. They wanted that. And HCG caps, that's the survey data. They did that, and they reported it. And then in 2016, 2017, they're going to take all of our PQRS measures and the 12 survey questions, not eight, it's 12, and any clinical data registry measures that qualify, and they'll report that. And then in 2018, it goes on the Internet. So all your data that's reported to the government is going to put, be put on the Internet. Consumer-driven health care. I get to go pick the internist that I want to go see. And I want to see if they're nice and friendly and if they do good work and they have quality metrics and all that kind of good stuff. See where this is going? By the way, do you think Medicare is the only one that's going to do this? So as soon as, and we're going to talk again about repeal of sustainable growth rate here very shortly. Um, when they came up with the new system, the very next week, Medicare was meeting with the big, the mega insurance companies, right? Because they keep buying each other and getting bigger. They met with the mega insurance companies because Medicare's big brother and what Medicare does, the private insurers tend to follow. And so you'll see the same type of systems starting to emerge from the private insurance plans. So you can't avoid this by avoiding Medicare patients. So if you're going to go into pediatrics, it's going to creep over into the other insurance plans. Meaningful use, that's questionable. Um, but this is the measures that we have for our information technology, right? Um, we're in the 2015-2016 modified stage two meaningful use era now. Um, so that means that we're reporting on some things like medication reconciliation and electronic prescribing and doing orders and giving visit summaries and you know, all that stuff that we do. That's part of these things. And a public health objective is in there, right? Immunization rates. So we have an interface with the state registry for immunizations. That's something that would be a public health objective. In 2017, it goes to two public health objectives. And the nine clinical quality measures in three domains, it's exactly the same as a PQRS because that's where they get it from, right? You see how these things all link? The value modifier system. So have you guys heard of value-based modifier or value-based purchasing? That's the hospital measures. So the hospitals have the VBM or VBP. On the outpatient side, we have value modifier. I, they get a report every year. It gets sent to us. It's called the Quality and Resource Utilization Report. How much money are your Medicare patients spending per year? If they're attributed to you, they show up on your QRUR report. So if your Medicare patient's going to the ER every month or every three weeks or whatever, that cost is attributed to your QRUR report. So they're looking at 
PQRS metrics, the expenditures of the patients attributed to you, and that gets put into a VM score. So remember, PQRS also includes your surveys. There they are again. And then your cost measures. And the cost measures are based on costs for all A and B, inpatient and outpatient. That's what A and B is. Hospital care is included. And cost for four conditions, diabetes, COPD, CAD, and heart failure. By the way, what else is in there? Readmissions and all-cause readmissions. So on the outpatient side, you get dinged for how often your patients get admitted. Hospitalization is a failure of outpatient management. That's what they're going with. Okay, so think about that. Why, am I, why are we stressing all this stuff? The point here is we have to manage populations. If you think that you can get away with being in medical practice and not managing your populations, it's not going to work. Because your quality, your performance, your success of your patient panel is being measured by these things, which means you have to interface with population health management. You can't get to it any other way. Okay, here's the newbie. The Merit-Based Incentive Payment System. MIPS. So it was signed into law 4-15-2015. So I gave this presentation last year on 4-16, right? So um, it repealed the sustainable growth rate. Remember, maybe in the last few years you heard about doc fix. Every year they had to do something about the doc fix or we were going to get a 28, 29, 30, 32% Medicare cut. That was a sustainable growth rate. It was a calculation based on old economics that didn't work. They got rid of it. When you get rid of something, you got to replace it. They replaced it with MIPS. Now, here's the interesting thing about MIPS. It's going to take all of this stuff that we were talking about, meaningful use, value-based system, or value modifier system, PQRS, and it's going to throw it all into a big pot and stir it around. The problem is the rules won't be finalized till the fall of 2016. So we're all trying to guess where this is going, right? But as I said, combines all of those systems that we talked about and then adds a clinical practice improvement domain or clinical practice improvement activities. You know all the stuff you're learning about improvement, quality improvement, performance improvement, whether it's PDSAs or how we're going to do a project, this is what this stuff is. If you don't do it, you're going to have trouble. So it changes your Medicare fee-for-service or payment-for-service system to either the MIPS or the alternative payment model, which still no one really understands what the alternative payment model is. Here's what they're looking at over the next few years. So, by the way, it's 2019, all right? Your MIPS score takes all that stuff, puts it in a pot, stirs it, and you get a score, and that score affects what you're going to get paid from Medicare. In other words... Imagine a multiplier conversion factor to your Medicare payment. That conversion factor is based on your MIPS score. So your MIPS score affects all your Medicare payments for that year. Well, where do they get the score in 2019? It's from your 2017 data. It's 2016 now. So what we're saying is next year your data counts for your MIPS score in 2019. So you're Medicare payments will be affected by your performance two years prior because that's as fast as they can do it. So you see what the percentages are. Quality is going to start off with quality. Outcomes, 50%, 45 down to 30. Resource used, how much money are your patients spending? That goes from 10 up to 30. So quality and cost, value, remember the value equation, that's 60% of your payment. Meaningful use down at the bottom, 25. Are you using your information technology, e-prescribing, medication reconciliation, transition to care management that's computerized, you know, all the things that we're talking about. And then the clinical practice improvement activity. Okay, so are you doing some QI stuff? Now, if you are, at least at this point, a certified or recognized patient-centered medical home, you automatically get the full 15%. You don't have to do anything else because they say you're already doing it. They have not said anything about the specialty practice, patient center specialty practice recognition. Um, we're waiting to see what the final rules say. 
this is an example. This is something that we sh we've been sharing with all the departments here at SIU about what the impact is, okay? So this is um, impact for us. So at the top, you can see it says CMS incentive. Actually, it says incentive. We've got to put an N in there. Incentive payment programs, right? And you can see them. Well, annual update, that extra 5% Medicare was supposed to pay us. Uh, we didn't get that. Not because it was us. I mean, they didn't give it to anybody. The PQRS penalty, 2%. Medicare EHR penalties, that's meaningful use. 1, 2, 3, 4% all the way up to 2018. And then the VM value modifier, your QRUR report, up to 1, 2, 4%. We don't even know what it's going to be in 2018. They haven't told us yet. So you can see the risk percentages. In 2019, it switches to MIPS. And it starts at 4%, and it goes up to 9% right, over a very short period of time. And remember, Medicare does everything budget neutral. So if I'm on the top side of that 50% line, I'm going to get some extra money, but that means that somebody below the 50% line just lost some money, right? And it's always proportional. So you can see for us at SIU in 2015, there's about 700 grand, and then there's a million this year, and there's 1.8 million in 2017. And then it's 1.1 million in 2018 because we don't know what the VM calculation is going to be. And then you go to 2019, and it goes back down to 700,000 and it moves up to 1.9, 1.8 million for us. So for us, $110 million corporation, right? That's healthcare, not the med school. It's 1.8, right? So it's, it's, it's verging in that 1 to 2% range. That's what we know about now. And that's just Medicare. What if all the private insurances are on this? And then this swing that they're talking about, a potential of a 27% difference between top performers and low performers, that number could easily creep to $10, $15 million. Real quick. OK. Um, questions about that? This is not to depress you. This is to prepare you for the fact that you can't ignore it. This will affect your paycheck, right? So when you're looking at jobs, you should be asking about how they're doing these things. Ask them about how their PQRS reporting is working. Ask them what their QRU report looks like. Ask them if they have the IT to pull all the stuff that needs to be done for your quality management. Ask them um, what their survey data looks like, because this affects your pay. All right. A couple of things that we know work, right? So this gets back to some of the stuff that we're going to talk about here. So um, this is medical home stuff. We have data on this. We don't have specialty practice, uh, patient center specialty practice data, because there aren't enough of them out there yet to really have anything. But this one looked at 14 medical home networks, 100% of them, 100%. Cost savings, improved metrics, less ER visits, reduced hospital admissions. That's why the clinical performance improvement activity score, you get the full 15% of your medical home because they know this happens. Community Care in North Carolina was the first one. They saved $900 million in six years for the state of North Carolina. By the way, what did they do with that savings? They distributed money back to the providers, all the providers, not just the primary care. Okay. Illinois Health Connect, Illinois Medicaid Medical Home Program. This was started by our former governor, Rob Lagojevich. Unfortunately, it was done illegally, but it worked really well. Um, so he is one of my favorite felons out of our governors that are felons. So um, what they did is they had the Medical Home Project, Illinois Health Connect, and all it said was, hey, patient, you pick a doctor. Pick anybody. And, um, and then they're going to see you and take care of you, and uh, you, doctor, are going to get a couple of bucks a month for, uh, per month per member payment. And then they started putting in some quality metrics for things like, did your diabetic get an A1C in the last 12 months? Did your asthma patient get a inhaler refill in the last 12 months. They weren't really stretching for high goals here, right? 
And they did that. And then the other thing is, is that they hired an outside consultant to do your healthcare plus, which was a high risk, high utilizer management plan. These were nurses. Didn't ha we didn't do anything. They did it all for us. And they contacted these high risk, high utilizer patients and tried to help them manage their care. And uh, so there was an evaluation done by the Robert Graham Center. So it's external. They looked at this. They looked at the data between 2004 and 2011. Four and five was pre-implementation, so that's your baseline data. And six through 10 was what happened afterwards. And so for Illinois Health Connect, that's the, just the regular plan. Find your physician. Hey, physician, you get two bucks per month per, uh, per member. And the red line is sort of, here's what we would predict from historic data of your per member per month cost. They would go up about five bucks per year. That's pretty standard, right? And the blue line or black line, whatever it is there, um, shows the actual. So the delta, the area under the curve, is the potential cost savings. And it was a total of about 30, or I'm sorry, uh, uh, $13 per member per month for the entire Illinois Medicaid population. And then your Healthcare Plus, your high cost, high utilizer patients. Now you can see the per member per month costs are in increments of 50, not five. And you can see the red lines predicted and the black or blue line is, is the uh, actual. And there is about $110 saved per member per month for high utilizer patients. And they just track the hospitalizations and you can see hospitalizations for our high risk patients dropped significantly after they were engaged. So engagement systems work. Here's the cost savings. So Illinois Health Connect, that regular Medicaid system, it just said find a primary, go see them, uh, saved half a billion dollars. And your Healthcare Plus, that's the outside, the external contract of people contacting your high-risk, high-utilizer patients um, to help them manage your care saved $1.5 billion. So at the time, we saved about $2 billion in a five-year time span, which was good. And then the next governor got rid of it. Not the one we have now, the one prior. So... Um, now we have managed Medicaid, which works so horribly well. Not at all. Um, so anyway, so this worked, and it was easy. So this is a system that worked and saved money. So um, you got to look for things like this. Uh, outcomes. So we save money, but remember, our value equation is outcomes over cost. Our cost went down. How about our outcomes? Well, colon cancer screening improved by 200%. And heart disease with the annual lipid profile management, 200%, and screening from mammography, you know, you see the numbers. It all went up. What didn't go up, post-acute MI on beta blocker. Where do we typically find folks who stop their uh, beta blocker after an MI? Where's a really good system that you guys see that always picks this up? Hospital, right? There's a joint commission requirement. So, you know, you know those things that happen when patients get admitted to the hospital. If they've got sepsis or an infection, they're supposed to get their antibiotics within X amount of time. Well, if they've had an MI, they're supposed to be on a beta blocker. They screen for this. We actually think the number went down because less patients were going to the hospital. And so the folks that weren't on their beta blocker anymore just weren't getting picked up by these other systems that we already have in place. Because the hospital systems, you know, for those of you who get this kind of data, like for my COPD management, and pneumonia management, and heart failure management, I get credit for it, but it's the hospital system that does it. They're all 100%. They get everybody. So it's a really good system. When you fall out of a good system, this is what happens. So this is the theory, this is the theory of why that one went down. Makes sense. I don't have any proof for that. Um, let me talk about local stuff, right? Because this that was Illinois, that was regional, so the local stuff, Memorial, what was Memorial doing? And, you know, if you look at this from a perspective of low risk, rising risk patients, so they're starting to develop chronic diseases, there might be pre-something, and then high risk patients, right, that's 5%. And you look at cost, that 
5% at the top eat up about half of your resources. That's why that high-risk, high-utilizer program that we talked about saved $1.5 billion, right? Because they use half your resources. Now, what Memorial did is they took a look at their own insurance plan because Memorial has an insurance plan for their employees. And so they can manage that insurance plan. When you manage an insurance plan, you know how much you're spending, you know what people are using, what resources, and you know what your outcomes are, right? So that's a nice thing to have. By the way, they have outpatient clinics, they have hospitals with some regional presence now, and they have self-insured plan, right? So they're approximating some of these bigger vertically integrated systems. Um, so you can start doing stuff like this with your own insurance plan. And that's exactly what they did. And they looked at this and said, well, for these high-risk patients, we need intensive medical home management, psychiatric issues, you know, substance, all that falls in there. For our rising risk folks, just a regular medical home, counseling, some education type of stuff. For our low-risk patients, keep them well, right? You're not going to spend a lot of resources, but you want to keep them well. And what else did they look at? So they looked at this and they said, well, we know payment transformation is occurring. We just talked about all that. And we know that there's transformation of care. And what does transformation of care mean in this sense? Well, we're going from fee for service, I get paid because I saw somebody, toward total cost accountability. Remember we talked about accountable care organizations, ACOs at the beginning. That's total cost accountability, meaning I am now responsible for the cost of the system. Or you got something in between, which is where I'm comfortable with. I'm comfortable with the middle. I'm a little afraid of the right side, to be perfectly honest. Here's what they've been doing. So they have um, a whole system set up to deal with population management now. And they have this whole list of things that they screen for, whether it's health literacy, financial issues, access, the diagnoses that they're interested in, how well they're managed, et cetera. They have access to all this information. That's the nice thing about having those pieces. And what they said is, look, we've got this population and we've got risk. And you've got one, two, three, right? And so one, moderate to low risk. They're stable, they're healthier. Well, maintain their care. That's what we're going to do. And then you get into two, that's that rising risk group. Remember the triangles we just looked at earlier, you need care management, and you're going to get a care management specialist. You're pre-diabetic. You're becoming diabetic. You have early COPD. Somebody's going to be working with you to make sure that you're managing this stuff. The high-risk, complex, uncontrolled patients, the ones we see frequently, right? they get complex care management. They have a complex case manager. These, patient, uh, these nurses are working with them directly to support their care and manage their care. That's that 5% that eat up 50% of your resources, right? This is what Memorial's doing with their own self-insured group. So they know who their high-risk patients are and they're addressing them. Well, here's what they have. So this is a 12-month period. And you can see there's two groups, rising risk, so that's your pre's or early chronic disease folks. And you can see they engaged 160 and graduated 69. You don't get 100% engagement from anybody. 50% engagement is a pretty darn good number. That's about as high as you're going to get. Um, and so what they did is, you, these bars are the, are the costs, right? 1,000, 15, whatever, dollar spent. And you're looking at this, and you see that those bars went down, right? Now, this doesn't necessarily look like a big difference, but these are $500 increments, right? And we saw what saving $110 on our complex patients in Illinois did for us. Well, those differences are about $100, $150. You know, you start, you got to really look at those bars. And then your high-risk patients, engaged 110, graduated. Look at the curve, right? Kind of similar if you think about it, even though it's a different representation. That slope of that curve is the same thing you saw on the high-risk hospitalization rates. You have to engage these folks and you get improvement. They only graduated 60, but again, if you get half of them, you're doing well. 
quality and appropriateness of care. So this is looking at care gaps. So they're not managed to a goal. Medication reconciliation, hugely important. If you can do anything for your transition to care of your patients, it's medication reconciliation. Highest impact on avoiding readmission. And then ED visits avoided. And look at the numbers as they go up. Again, they look small when you look at this graph as a whole, but you know there's a 20-point difference between the numbers there. Medication reconciliation accuracy, those are 5% increments, and care, cap, care gaps closed, that's in hundreds. And so you can see these. the red line is the ED visits avoided. How much does an average ED visit cost you? Right? Is it five grand? I mean, it, you know, these things have big numbers attached to it. Medico medication reconciliation accuracy going up, and then the bars are your care gaps closed. And as you can see over time, they've closed a bunch of care gaps. Those go up. So I think we're close to out of time, too. So anyway, um, there's a lot of changes going on in care and payment uh, as far as transformation to uh, a system based on population health outcomes, right? There are ways to make it work for you that's been shown. So these aren't impossible things to achieve, but as you're looking at systems and who you want to work for, ask the questions that you need to ask so that you're set up for success. If you're going to go somewhere and they don't have any of these things on their radar screen or they don't have some solutions for you, you should be worried. So pick your employer carefully, right? Don't just go willy-nilly off somewhere and think that they're going to take care of it for you um, because this will affect your payment. This is, it's not going to be about volume five years from now. As far as patients go, it's going to be about outcomes and how much they're spending. Beyond this slide, I've got some other things as far as evidence, blah, blah, blah. You can look at, well, I'll, I'll make those available through the GMEC office or GME office. Um, as far as evidence goes, questions. I want to keep us on time. I have lulled you into stupor, so that's good. <laughs> All right, I've done my job then. Okay. All right, thank you.